after completing a recent laboratory VO2 max test at the University of South Australia, I sat down with Dr. Max Nelson, lecturer in exercise and sports science, to dive into the fascinating topic of VO2 max. This is the fifth and final snippet of the full interview discussion, where we now get to the meaty question of what is the best way to improve our VO2 max, including the vexing topic of polarized training. Should we be only sharing our time between low intensity and high intensity work, or should we embrace the entire spectrum of training intensities? Let's hear Dr. Nelson's insight into these contentious subjects. How do we improve VO2 max, Max? It's a good question. Uh, VO2 is a number that this, there's, <laughs> We could talk about this for about four hours, but I guess the uh, just a few minutes. Rewind, <laughs> I guess the key thing with improving your VO2, there's two things. One is where you're starting from, uh, and one is where do you want to get to. If you're starting from totally untrained, so someone who's you know really unfit uh, or hasn't been doing anything and looking to get back into it, doing just about anything is going to improve your fitness. So yep. Movement will cause your physiology to upregulate and probably improve your VO2. Levels. Once you've got past the point of just starting and you've been going out for some you know, easy jogs, easy rides, things like that, the best way to improve your VO2 max, given it's a number that reflects what are you doing at your maximal intensity when you're pushing as hard as you can, the best way to improve that is to train at a level above that. So you're going to need to expose yourself the best way, on average at least, to improve your VO2 max is to use intervals and high intensity work that is above the effort that gets you the VO2. So when you were doing your test, I think we hit your VO2 max at 450 watts or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we got, we got to 450. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that means that you want to be exposing yourself to intensities that are above 450 watts. It doesn't have to be sit there and do it as long as you can for once and then you know drag your limp corpse off the bike at the end. But <laughs> hitting that at off. once, hitting that again, recover, hit it again, recover, hit it again to give your physiology a lot of time upregulated at that same level. Uh, with anything you want to improve in uh, training, sport, exercise, we always say specificity is key. So if you want to improve your VO2 max, you've got to get to VO2 max. Yeah, yeah. If you want to improve your ability to run a long distance, go run a long way or try to. And so that specificity is the key thing here. You want to improve a high end parameter, you've got to get to that high end and hit it repeatedly at lots of intervals are a great way to do it because you can hit it for two minutes, recover, hit it for another two. Whereas if we just said do it once as long as you can and only five minutes and done, if you break yep. it up into two minute intervals, you might get 10 of them done and that's more total time, more total stimulus. So I've seen uh, programs talking about um, repetitions of three minutes, mm -hmm. repetitions of five minutes, repetitions of up to eight minutes. And yep. I've kind of heard you shouldn't be going over eight minutes. Um, does that all sound reasonable? It all does sound reasonable. The key thing to remember is that the harder you work, the less you can do it for. Yeah. So if you're looking at going for eight minutes, don't try and do the same thing you do for eight minutes that you do for three minutes, because it's probably going to put you in a position where you're using a different bit of your physiology than what you actually are intending to. Yeah. So uh, for VO2, there's a lot of research that shows those like two minute, three minute intervals can work really well. So shorter is better. But there's also a lot of, and lots of probably the strongest research for improving VO2 uh, does a lot of things like 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Uh, so it might be if you're on a treadmill, 30 seconds running, 30 seconds straddling. If you're on a bike, 30 seconds working really hard, 30 seconds just really rolling your legs over like your pedals are made of glass. Yeah. Uh, and then doing that 30 on 30 off, so even those really short, sharp, shiny intervals, but lots of them, maybe 12 at a time with a five minute rest in between each lot of 12, uh, they actually can have a really big VO2 effect as well. Okay, you know, I haven't seen that discussed too much on the interweb, but um, that sounds quite palatable. Tell me about polarized training. Mm, uh, I've done I've done a video recently on Tadej Pogacar's original coach was uh, was discussing zone two being uh, a wonderful uh, formula for success, and then comparing that to uh, another chap who's um, talking more about zone three and, and other zones being equally as useful. What's the story, Max? Yeah, it's uh, hopefully I don't get attacked on Twitter after this interview with these questions, AB, because it's definitely an area that people have got some strong opinions in for sure. Um, I, so I think the thing with polarized training is that different things are going to work for different people. And 
you've got to you've got to be careful not comparing what we're doing as mere mortals uh, to what people are doing at a professional level. I think for someone like Tade Pogacar or any really high level cyclist who's riding 25 hours a week, what they're going to do and how they're going to split up their training is probably going to look very differently to somebody who's doing you know six or seven hours of cycling a week. Nice. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, if you've got less time to probably get a benefit out of your training, you've probably got to consider, oh, what can I do to get the bang for my buck out of training? With someone like Tato Pagacha, he can do a lot of time and afford to do a lot of time at those low intensities and then just offset it with some really polished work at particular times because he's doing so much. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing less, you might need to think, oh, I need to have a bit more of a spread across the different zones that I'm training at to be able to uh, really develop in the time I've got available. He, Tade Pigancha might be doing 80% in zone two and only a little bit at the higher intensity zones, but if you apply that to someone who's only riding five hours a week, that might mean you only end up doing 25 minutes a week of high intensity work when you use that same basis, and that's probably not enough to really see that much improvement. Yep. The th theory behind uh, polarized training is, is pretty good. We're actually doing some research at the moment uh, reviewing some literature and it shows that all methods are likely to work if you go and you train hard whether it's one split or the other they're probably all likely to give you a benefit uh, but there are going to be some people and in some circumstances where polarized works a lot better the theory behind polarized training is really really strong yeah. uh, in practice it seems to be that if you ride a bike and go for a run and you have a well-designed training program whether it's got lots of zone two zone three four five what have you uh, you're going to see a strong benefit, but different people might see a different one that works better for them. My experience with Zone 2 is it just feels like you're not working hard enough to do anything useful. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing because it does feel a little bit like that. The thing is that the way your physiology responds is, from an aerobic perspective, the thing that we're really interested in is the mitochondria, or one of the things really interested in, which is the powerhouse of your cells. It's where yep. the energy is actually made yep. aerobically in your cells. The theory is that uh, when you're doing those low intensity work, so you know, that base kilometers on a bike, if you will, uh, what happens there is what you do is you build up the number of mitochondria that you've got within your cells. So although it doesn't feel like you're doing much, that sends a signal to your muscles to say, let's get more of these tiny little engine factories in our muscles. Yeah. And then what happens is the high intensity work that you do, that builds up the size of those mitochondria. Now, as you can probably imagine, if you've got if you've done a lot of lower intensity work, that means you've got 200 rather than 100 of these little powerhouses of the cell, and then you do the high intensity work, you increase the size of those 200 as opposed to those previous 100. That's going to give you more total ability to release energy. So although it feels like it's not doing anything, I promise it is, and it is all a benefit. Uh, so you can embrace those long coffee rides through the hills because Wonderful. they are they are doing something for you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, Max, well, I really appreciate your time this morning and um, in uh, an offer of gratitude, I have a, um, a croissant, which, yes. which I offer, offer to you now. Thank you, best payment um, I can get. <laughs> I really appreciate you spending some time with me this morning and I look forward to getting on the bike and having a ride with you at some time in the not too distant future. Absolutely. Pleasure, mate. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yeah.